Well, welcome to, um, yeah, the, the very last lecture of the year. Now, um, not one I was, I was hoping to get away with it, but several of you have asked for it. Uh, so now it is uh, 20 to 6 on a Friday afternoon, and uh, I'm doing what I hope will be the last act of a very, very exhausting week. Um, I presented this to class, um, so in, in fairness, um, to you guys out there um, who I suspect have been really hitting the textbook quite hard. Um, this is a quick summary of some of the key areas. You'll notice if you go through the list that I've prepared for you um, that there's some areas that I don't touch on. Don't take that as a hint. Oh, that, that won't be in the exam, please. Um, that list, that's that, that um, Word document that you can find on Moodle. Um, about the exams. Uh, remember it's under, I'll just have a look at my computer now. Um, let me have a look. So it's under latest news, I believe. Yeah, it's under latest news on the right, the ultimate exam advice. Uh, click on that and then go to the top right where there's a Word document downloaded. That's the gospel in relation to the exams. Um, this is just a quick overview. All right, let's get started. So as basically I've tried to um, uh, you know, mix things into four different themes here. Uh, and so we'll cover these four themes uh, relatively quickly. Um, all right, so starting off, personalities and performance. Uh, just a couple of quick types of um, issues that relate to personality performance. Remember, type A personalities. These are the time urgent um, people who simply uh, are driven to work. Um, they incessantly struggle to achieve more. Um, often, uh, you know, these are, these are high achieving types, driven types. Um, it's a, um, it is a personality construct in that it's a enduring uh, characteristic of human beings, but this kind of personality, while it's often desirable in employees, it also comes at the top at the cost of being a good team player. Proactive personalities. Remember, we talked about this in the semester. Those are self leaders, effectively people who can run themselves, drive themselves, persevere till meaningful change occurs. But they also are the type who are self driven enough to go and out and leave the business and start their own business, for example. Twin studies, I like to remind you of this because twin studies are one of the um, gold standard methods of working out what can be put down to personality and what can be put down to environment. Remember, this particular argument within psychology and organisational behaviour tends to be called the nature-nurture debate. Nature being those stuff that you're born with and that generally includes majority of that's genetics but in addition, there can be some intrauterine uh, characteristics of, of you know, being inside your mum that can cause characteristics that mark you for life. These are things, nature are the things that you're given. Um, environment is the things that happen to you once you're born, that shape who you become. Now, um, I want to draw your attention to the fact that um, um, because this is personality and performance, remember, meta-analysis by the, these guys of 60 other studies, and meta-analysis is where you take lots and lots of studies, crunch them together and see if you can come up with some statistically significant themes out of all these different studies. So this meta-analysis showed that all of the big five, and you can remember them from the canoe, uh, mnemonic, mnemonic uh, canoe or ocean, uh, so let's go with ocean, or, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, neuroticism, oh, I, I'm go I've gone now, haven't I? Ocean, uh, openness, uh, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. Um, all of those five tend to be associated with entrepreneurial intentions, including, Lee, including oddly enough, a neuroticism, except for agreeableness. And they tend to also be associated with entrepreneurial team performance. And interestingly, risk taking was not, which is odd considering the fact that entrepreneurialism is somewhat a risk taking uh, kind of practice, you would think. Of the big five, uh, openness to experience, not surprisingly, tends to be associated with uh, the greatest degree of effectiveness on global projects or international assignments. 
Introverts, often are high achievers. Um, that's a term invented uh, or, or coined by Jung in the 1920s, who was a um, psychoanalyst from a medical background and had quite a spiritual component to his kind of um, psychology. Um, anyway, uh, generally, extroverts are better at things that require communication, leadership, and teamwork. Introverts tend to be better at corporate performance, uh, focusing on core skills and achievements, not so much the socialising stuff and the networking stuff. But remember the study that I did talk about a few weeks back, saying that introverts are a good fit um, with proactive, self-leading employees. Um, so that's partly because self-leaders one shouldn't micromanage shelf leaders because that tends to disempower them. And extroverts, oh, sorry, introverts are better at leaving people alone and you know, giving them, empowering them to do what they should do. Uh, Holland's personality uh, job fit theory, it's a good, the, the case that I just gave of introversion and proactive personalities, that's a good example of that. Um, Holland's personality job fit theory claims there are six different types of basic personality, realistic, investigative, social, conventional, enterprising and artistic, with personality characteristics attached to each of these. Now there is some evidence for example, the one I gave you just before, of four th fit theories. And for example, extroversion does tend to fit better with aggressive team oriented cultures. Agreeableness tends to fit with supportive organizations. Not surprising, all this stuff is kind of logical. Um, but good fit does predict the big three, um, or two of the big three. It doesn't predict productivity here, but it does predict um, job satisfaction, commitment, and low turnover, uh, which means leaving the job and going to a new job. I wanted to remind you about the Hawthorne and the Pygmalion studies. Uh, for most of you guys, you, you'll, you'll be quite familiar with that. Remember that both these kind of studies deal with the impact of, imp of faith and expectation on behaviour. Uh, quickly to recap, the Hawthorne studies were done in, in electric bulb factories in the 1920s, I believe, where um, they looked at the impact of simply looking, investigating something on the thing that you're investigating. So they found in factory setting that simply investigating the staff made them improve and change their performance. The Pygmalion studies on the other hand, and the Pygmalion effect comes from this, um, is the f effect where the faith of a manager or a teacher or someone in a position of power in a lower level employee res results in better behaviour on the part of the employee or the, or the student that justifies the original faith of the individual. And what it really means there is faith alone, belief alone, expectations alone on behalf of a um, superior will improve one's performance. Interesting point for you to take forward into the workplace. Remember also the conformity studies from Ash, uh, you know where um, you know um, people were in a room, the different line sizes. Remember where people were stooges or actors were all said the wrong thing, and a genuine citizen felt a strong urge, particularly if a lot of people had said black is white the um, individuals felt a very strong urge to conform and say, yeah, black is white. Reference groups are those important groups to which individuals belong that tend to influence our behaviour. So, you know, out groups, people from outside your group, don't have as big impact on our conformity urge as people within our group. Um, group size affects group behaviour and thus group performance. Small groups are faster at completing tasks. Um, individuals perform better in small groups due to the impact of what we call social loafing. Um, and social loafing is where we tend to compare our behaviour to the least in our reference group and tend to drop our average performance to not the best in the group of reference group around us, but the worst. Um, Remember we talked about in problem solving, for example, in juries, large groups are better, um, they, that, that they create greater diversity generally uh, and greater um, ideas creation than smaller groups. Um, 
remember uh, in relation to juries um, diversity um, in juries. So, and we're talking about surface level diversity. So, diversity that's visible. For example, lots of black and white or male and female um, members of juries mixed in diversity tend to deliberate longer um, and tend to question things more. There's less conformity in that kind of ju uh, jury duties. Um, if you want people to initiate action, um, smaller group sizes tend to be better at initiating action than larger groups where that social loafing kicks in. Remember that tug of war study from Max Ringelmann where, you know, uh, the German study where he assumed, uh, because at that stage the, the state of the art suggested that groups had that group energy that was greater than the sum of the parts. But he showed that in a tug of war situation, for example, that the individuals performed, pulled less and less on that rope the more people that were in their team. Individually, they had a lower pull per person. Um, social loafing tends to be uh, something of a Western problem in collectivist cultures where people are used to over generations and used to within a lifetime working in groups. This kind of social loafing effect or problem is muted. Um, you can reduce the social loafing problem by setting group goals, increasing intergroup competition, um, engaging in individual peer evaluation, um, make sure you focus or put the spotlight on to motivated members, individually reward individuals who perform well within the group to set better standards for the group, that kind of thing. Groupthink, just a quick reminder of that one. It's um, where people start to, um, you know, a bit like social loafing, they start to form a consensus, a, a rather lazy consensus within the group. Over, it, it tends to reduce good quality decision making, consideration of alternatives. It tends to happen in stronger groups, groups with stronger culture or larger groups. And you can counter it by appointing people to be devil's advocate or deliberately focusing on dissent. And group shift. Now, Think about a group uh, and average the opinion of that group on a particular issue. Group shift suggests that on occasions when a, a vocal minority takes hold of a discussion, um, that an argument can shift in either a surprisingly conservative or risky direction, more often the risky side, uh, but exaggerate the initial position, you'd kind of expect a group discussion to add up with this kind of boring grey middle ground. But group shift suggests that on occasion there is this surprising shift away from that, um, that middle position. Okay. Just quickly focusing on diversity. Diversity, boring slides, by the way, for which I apologise. Um, diversity tends to increase group conflict, um, especially early on until things settle down. It reduces cohesiveness. It can be bad for creativity, but also potentially good. Um, surface level diversity, as I noted before, in relation to the jury studies, tends to cue recognition of diversity and subsequently stimulate creativity uh, and good quality discussions and disagreement. Diverse juries, as I said, share more information, uh, are less likely to engage in groupthink and deliberate longer. Asians have less of this in-group bias than Americans, so there is a cultural difference in, in you know, in-group bias is kind of where you see everything within your group is great and everything on people outside as being uh, awful. Asians tend to have a more rounded view uh, than, for example, Americans or individualistic cultures. Now, cohesiveness in groups, and so we're talking a little bit about groups here, by the way, uh, but we're also talking about, um, uh, we're still on, in, in, to some degree, on individual difference, but I think we've sort of segued off here. Cohesiveness impacts on productivity. Um, so cohesive teams uh, do tend to be more productive than non-cohesive teams, um, but it does depend on group performance norms. So for example, um, 
if the norm within the group is to be lazy and slack or poor quality, then that's what's going to reflect on the outcomes of the group. Uh, you need good quality norms in order to get good quality impacts from cohesiveness. So there's what we call a contingency. If norms are good, productivity is good, cohesive groups is good. But you can increase cohesiveness artificially. If you've got a good group norm, that is, you can make it a smaller, uh, a smaller group, less diverse group. It's a bit of a shame, but that's how it is. Higher status group, that is, elevate the sense of importance of the group so that people feel that strong in-group loyalty, uh, introduce group rewards, and also isolate groups from other groups so that they have this greater sense of identity. In decision making, groups tend to generate more complete information and knowledge, more greater diversity of views and uh, with provisors, also acceptance of solution. And by that acceptance, I mean if you come to a decision through group discussion, people are more likely to come out of that meeting saying, well, we made this decision, we made this decision, we accept it. In de if, but decision making, of course, does slow down in groups. There's also that conformity pressure, that group think. Um, and who takes responsibility? Yes, it's true about the sense of we in acceptance of the, of the decision, um, but there also can be blame shifting within a group. Um, creativity tends to be higher in decisions, but I did want to remind you of the Beatles experiments, um, where the Beatles, they looked at analysis of Beatles hits that were written by either Ringo, George, or John, or whatever, um, as individual songwriters, or when they wrote songs collectively, and then they measured their performance on the charts and found that uh, individually written songs tended to perform higher. Uh, almost a kind of social loafing going on there, uh, but also perhaps a competitiveness between the individuals wanting to perform and show that they were the special one. Um, uh, just talking about group decision making again, some of the things that you can do um, to um, deal with uh, quality decisions and reduce this problem of groupthink is hold, for example, electronic meetings where people deliver feedback uh, synchronously or asynchronously. Um, so they'll deliver feedback without seeing what other people are saying relatively anonymously. Or other kinds of nominal group techniques, NGTs, where individuals write down their thoughts not on electronic form, before the meeting and present their ideas before this group discussion starts to flatten uh, the peaks of different opinions out. Right, so conflict, negotiation, communication. Okay, so remember this traditional versus interactionist view. Um, remember traditional views Conflict bad, interaction with you, conflict is potentially positive and even essential for good group performance. Um, both sides are backed by some evidence. Um, remember the five stages within the uh, textbook of this sense of potential opposition or incompatibility, um, this moment of cognition where uh, you realize that there is a potential conflict there and you begin to personalize it in relation to yourself intention to act, uh, behavior, which is the hot stage of, um, of conflict, and then these outcomes, which can include the uh, things like, um, uh, you know, uh, productivity or decision-making quality, good or bad, depending on how things are resolved. Um, research tends to show that either too much or too little communication can be this cause, this um, potential or latent uh, conflict to arise. Um, this cognition stage, the textbook talks about perceived conflict versus felt conflict. Um, these intentions, this third stage, can either be intentions to compete, which is characteristic of the traditional view, or intentions to collaborate, um, uh, or potentially avoid conflict, or accommodate, or compromise. These are the different options. Um, and if you want more on this, go back to the original lectures. This is really, as I say, a quick, quick summary. Techniques to resolve conflict can include 
focusing on the problem as opposed to focusing on what I want, etc. Focus on the superordinate level, which is the big picture view of the problem. Try and expand resources available. Don't just talk about money, but talk about, for example, work-life balance, for example, as being a potential you know, bargaining point. Um, avoidance, smoothing, compromise, these are also techniques that can help deal with conflict. Authoritative command, which refers to you guys shut up, cool off, piss off, that kind of thing. Or altering the human or structure and variables. The human variables we're talking about here are things like um, you guys have been quibbling for weeks, I'm sending you over to that side of the factory and I'm sending you over to that side of the factory. Structural variables is look, we've got problems with logistics here, uh, we're going to increase the number of deliveries to four times a day to kind of reduce the conflict that's being caused by logistics. Techniques that tend to stimulate conflict can include using ambiguous or threatening messages, bringing in outsiders, uh, organisational restructures that alter rules always increase um, um, stress, increasing interdependence, uh, disrupting the status quo, Interdependence, by the way, um, is where you've got elements within your organisation that are highly dependent on each other. And the greater the interdependence between individuals within an organisation or sections within an organisation or within the structure of an organisation, the greater you've got this interdependence, the greater potential for conflict and the more impact that any one piece of problem has on other pieces of problem because they're connected. Disrupt the status quo, point a devil's advocate who tells everybody the truth. Not that we want to hear. Oh, sorry. Okay. The interactionist view of conflict is that conflict can be functional or dysfunctional. Functional conflict assists with, um, you know, breaking things up, you know, stirring things up, creating greater creativity, um, potentially if it's resolved properly, a sense of greater engagement, belonging to the organisation, improves the quality of decision making and also makes people realise there's a problem, creates awareness of a conflict. The uh, two views, the interactionist and, and traditional view, have sort of given away in more recent times of this managed conflict view where we recognise that high levels of conflict are almost always bad, despite all the rosy picture that the interactionist view tended to, to take. Um, and, you know, that subsequently that kind of stress that's caused by high levels of conflict um, can also lead to poorer decision making and poorer outcomes generally for the organisation. And on the other hand, we need to recognise that conflict is inevitable. So, uh, taking the real world view of things, we need to recognise conflict is going to happen and it maybe has some good, good aspects to it, particularly on a lower level scale, but it needs to be kept to that lower level scale, that productive uh, level before it starts to get out of hand. So, negotiation, we've got these two approaches. Um, you know, they have very different goals, motives, interest, information, orientation, duration for orientation and focus. So just quickly, the distributive approach tends to believe, you know, you've got to try and get the maximum for yourself as opposed to let's expand the pie so everyone gets something. Win-win is the integrative approach. Win-lose is the distributive approach. On the interest side, us versus them, me versus you, whereas looking for some congruence in interests is the focus here with the integrative approach. Information pros, holding your cards close to your chest is the distributive approach. Putting your cards on the table is the um, integrative approach to information. The duration thing is particularly interesting. We've talked about this before, but just to repeat, companies Elements within a company who come to the negotiation table need to realise to a large degree it's inevitable that they're going to have to work together, whether it's customer versus client, so customer versus supplier or union versus boss. There is a relationship that's going to continue to the long term and having too short a term focus, which is more the distributive approach, may lead you to win early on but lose in the long run. Now the focus within distributive uh, bargaining approaches is me, 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 what's my position, what I want. The focus on integrative bargaining is let's investigate what it is, try and work out 
what it is, what you want, what has, what's driven you to this point. So the process of, of um, negotiation involves, you know, starting with investigating the, the, the setting conditions and understanding the um, what caused it, um, thinking about the durability of the relationship, which I just referred to, talk about this BATNA business, best alternative to a negotiated agreement, which I like to just simply refer to as, you know, the bottom line. You know, this is my absolute bottom line that I'm not prepared to go beyond, or the, you can also point at there's the lowest acceptable point or point of resistance. And you need to try and determine your own before you go into it, and you also need to determine the other person's as much as it's possible. So individualness, individual differences, we talked about this um, in the essay, but uh, for those of you who did the essay, you can almost skip this bit. But you know, agreeableness and extroversion tend to be not good things for negotiation, partly because um, these are the type of people who share more information and are nicer than they should, particularly in distributive bargaining. Agreeableness, agreeableness and extroversion, but mainly agreeableness, agreeableness can be considered quite good for integrative approaches. IQs, not a particularly strong predictor of negotiation success. It is a predictor, but the correlation isn't very strong. Um, in distributive bargaining, the evidence is that anger is quite good, particularly where the uh, angry party is higher in status or equal status um, to the not so angry party. Uh, have a read of the textbook on this one, quite interesting. Anxious anxiety, which is often associated with neuroticism, tends not to be particularly good. You tend to pull out of bargaining more quickly than you should. Uh, collectivist cultures are often more integrative in approach. Men and women, as the textbook notes, don't necessarily negotiate very differently. Uh, if you videotape play by play what they're up to, it's pretty much the same. But the way that we view women, the stereotypes, it's a good word to remember, the stereotypes that we have of women, tends to, you know, obstruct their ability to negotiate as effectively as men because we see men as tougher, we see women as more agreeable, even when they're not. And that, that simple perception, this is almost like a Hawthorne or um, expectancy effect. Um, so it's simply by, or Pygmalion effect, simply by what we think about things that we impact on what actually happens. So communication. Um, just quickly, remember communication serves four different functions within the organisation. It, it can be used by managers or others to control. It can be used by managers or others to motivate. Uh, it can be useful as a, a flow of information within the organisation or simply a flow of um, emotional expression. Um, now remember the issue of the channel which I might just have a look at here. So you've got this, this is Shannon Weaver's model of communication. Sender sends, uh, it, it, there's, there's two parties involved generally, the sender and the receiver. They don't have to be individuals, they can be groups. Uh, they have to encode the message. It goes through this channel or multiple channels. In the case of face-to-face -face contact, it's a rich channel, what we call rich, multiple channels, uh, where the interference is called noise. And once the message has got across to the receiver, it has to be decoded. If the receiver understands or doesn't understand, he can give feedback. And on the basis of that feedback, the sender might try and tweak the message, re-encode it, put it through the whole noise barrier again, and hope for the best. So that's the Shannon Weaver model of communication. Now, the channel, as I said up there, that's the means through which the message travels. And you can have rich channel, rich media channels, poor uh, media channels. Um, you know, here I'm talking to you with a bit of body language, a bit of facial expression, um, my voice, and the text you see on the screen. So it's a relatively rich. I can't see you, so it doesn't allow very effective feedback. So that's one limitation of this. Um, just quickly, oral, written, Oral has its advantages, it's fast and flexible, it allows feedback, but it also has this distortion element because, um, you know, we're not, we don't have time to precisely lay out 
what we're going to say, I have to do it on the run. Written has got that kind of advantage. It has time, it, it, you've got time to um, put it down in as plain version as you can. It's tangible, it's permanent, it has some legal provability, but it also has legal implications. There's also downward um, and upward and lateral. Downward boss to employee, upward employee to boss. Remember the term employee voice and voice mechanisms in relation to communication. Uh, I'm more than happy if you use those in your exams if it comes to that. Um, lateral communication is on the same level as where you are. Um, one study suggested that two-thirds of employees say the boss never asks for advice, so isn't looking for any upward information. Another suggested Another study suggested that employees are twice as likely to be committed where there is good quality downward communication if a plan is, is properly downward communicated. Remember these three types of um, uh, groups in relation to communication. The chain, which is more typical of the army. Uh, it's a chain of command type of process. It's very linear and rigid. Uh, it also can have advantages in that it's clear. You're not speaking to more than one person. Uh, the wheel uh, formation, it's fast. Um, the boss communicates directly just to every person. You can notice it has advantages over the chain. And the all channel, it's quite satisfying. It's very, very flexible, but it's also chaotic and quite informal. Um, some of the terms used with informal communication are gossip, the rumor mill, um, and uh, I think that's it. Informal communication tends not to be controlled by management. Um, it has significant risks if it gets out of hand and is inaccurate. Um, when you're, uh, this is a badly organized um, uh, slide, if you can call it that, uh, but in order to reduce rumors uh, and reduce the dangers of the grapevine, uh, you can create quite clear timetables where you will announce big decisions so people know in advance the news, the real news is coming out later. Then explain, reveal, reconcile properly. Flag not just the positives but also the downsides. So give two-sided information and discuss those worst case scenarios rather than allow um, the grapevine or the gossip mill to um, to uh, fester on these kind of potential negatives. And that's it for today. That's, um, in fact, not a comprehensive uh, coverage, but that's all I got to in class yesterday. And it's all I've got energy for you today. Um, so very best of luck uh, for the exam on Monday. And um, remember to get some good sleep before the exam, uh, as I think I said to you before. And uh, don't overeat because it's a two o'clock exam, which is kind of like the worst possible time to hold an exam in terms of sleepiness, particularly if you have a big meal for lunch. But I suspect a lot of you will be too nervous to scoff down anything too substantial an hour or two before the exam. Uh, but take it easy. Three hours is plenty to do the exam. Um, you've got plenty of time. Time's not your enemy here. I think stress, nerves, which impact on your ability to remember things, that's your biggest enemy. So give yourself the time to calm down if necessary. Make notes, and if you can't quite remember something, come back to it later. Just move calmly on to the next thing. You don't, it's not a writing contest to see who can produce as many words as possible. Of course, if you've got a, a brilliant photographic memory, write plenty of words that are relevant to the answer and hallelujah for you. But if you know, you're struggling a bit, uh, don't be too hard on yourself. Give yourself a moment to recover or more than a moment and write down what you can remember that relates to the question. Don't feel like you need to write stuff down just to try and fill in space in order to accumulate points. That's not necessary at all, and it won't accumulate your points. Only relevant material will accumulate your points. So best of luck, and um, yeah, we will uh, we'll, uh, see some of you during the exam, and feel free to email me after the exam to um, tell me how you, how you went. Thanks very much.